I just think you can make great connections with people when you're real about the journey because there are great parts. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful, beautiful abs. You wake up in the morning, you see that sunrise and it's just gorgeous. And you take that picture. You don't even need a filter. There are plenty of those days. And there are other days that are not, not pretty at all. This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 118 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, 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 everyone. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Now, this week was President's Week here in the United States. And so that meant that a lot of the normal activities that I'm usually involved in during the evenings were canceled. And so I thought that I was really going to be able to get a lot of homesteading stuff done this week. And I was excited to share that with you. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. Between a fairly sizable snowstorm here uh, this week, um, my forgetfulness as I left a credit card at a restaurant that I was at last weekend down in Albany, and so I had to drive down there to pick it up. Uh, other life events, let's just say that I didn't get near as much done as I'd hoped, but I do have a few things that I do want to share with you. And so let's head on over to this week's Homestead Happenings, and I'll bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. The first thing I wanted to share with you is that we have been enjoying some great homestead meals here on the homestead. And one of them we had this evening. My wife, Bonnie made this delicious, uh, amazing potato sausage and kale soup. And in fact, I posted pictures of it over on our social media, on Instagram, on Facebook. So if you don't follow us there, definitely uh, check it out. But folks, it was absolutely scrumptious, as they say somewhere. I don't know where, but mm, it was it was just it was very, it was very good. Um, I spent the day today teaching snowboarding. It was a gorgeous day. But when I came back from snowboarding and I sat down to that soup, it just hit the spot. But the other thing that was really awesome about it, not only was it delicious, but most of the ingredients in that soup, the potatoes, the kale, the sausage, etc., all came from our homestead. And folks, as I've shared with you before, there is just a sense of satisfaction that comes from enjoying the fruits of your labor in the middle of winter. And so I was just so happy and I wanted to share that with you. I actually have shared the recipe over in the, um, the recipe channel on our homestead uh, journey supporting listeners discord server and i'll actually be including it in our upcoming newsletter and so if you're interested in becoming a member of the supporting listeners program you can do so by visiting the homesteadjourney.net slash support and if you're interested in signing up for the newsletter head on over to the homesteadjourney.net slash newsletter and uh, i think you'll enjoy both of them at least give it a whirl. And uh, if it's not for you, that's fine. No harm, no foul. But uh, I'm really, really enjoying what we've got going on over uh, on the Discord server. A great group of people there. A lot of encouragement that's happening. And uh, so you definitely don't want to miss out on that. And certainly the newsletter, uh, I think, is going to be chock full of homestead goodness. So definitely give it a whirl. And if you don't like it, unsubscribe. I'm not going to be offended, okay? All right. The second thing I wanted to share with you is that uh, this week I discovered a bit of a problem with the housing 
for Boris, my youngest boar, and his girlfriend, Betswine Ross. What I discovered is that they had actually rooted around and kind of dug out the floor of their housing to the point to where it was about 18 inches below the surrounding area. Now, I don't know about where you live, but uh, here on Bald Mountain, water runs downhill. <laughs> and so they had created kind of like this little pond, shall we say, in their house. And while at times it would freeze over as they laid in there, their body heat caused that mucky mud and water and whatnot to kind of thaw out. And it's just not, it's not an environment that is, is good for them. And it's certainly not the conditions that I want to be keeping my pigs in. Now, normally I keep their housing kind of topped off with hay during the winter, but uh, I was running low on hay before the ranger danger died. And I just have not been able to get the trailer hooked up and up to the farm to pick up another load of hay. And so that's kind of why I hadn't caught this problem before this week. So what I went ahead and did is I took a pallet and put a piece of plywood on it and wedged it in the housing. So there's now a floor and that'll raise them up out of that muck and mess. And hopefully um, that's going to be a bit of a better situation. And then once I get it topped off with hay, um, it should be a much more comfortable housing and living situation than uh, what they had been experiencing. One of the other things I noticed this week as well is that Betswine was getting a bit thinner than I want. Um, Boris really was out competing her for food. Now, I've been feeding them lately in some of those rubber bowls that you can get at like tractor supply or at farm stores. But what I found is that Boris was really just shoving her off the feed and she wasn't getting as much as what I would like. And while I certainly could up the ration, he was just going to outcompete her for the upped ration. And so today what we did is we went ahead and moved Betswine over with the little pigs that are kind of our grow out, shall we say, our feeder pigs. And folks, it was the easiest move we have ever had here on the farm. Now, I don't know if it's just that we're getting better at this, <laughs> or maybe she just was in a great spirit today. I don't know, but it certainly was the easiest move we've ever, we've ever experienced. But in part, that's because we have our pigs trained to follow a bucket. And I cannot emphasize to you enough the importance of training your pigs to follow buckets. We were able to get Betswine through the gate and out of the pen and keep Boris in the pen. So that was awesome. And then I gave the bucket with feed in it to Brian Jay and he kind of took off on a, on a trot up the hill towards the other pen. And she just ran right after him. And then we opened up the uh, gate at the other pen and she went right on in. And folks, again, it was the easiest move that we've ever had. But I attribute that to us having her trained to follow a bucket. And so if you get pigs, I don't care how much you feed your pigs. I recommend that you put the feed in buckets, whether it's a quart of feed or whether you're feeding you know, a 40 pound or a 50 pound sack at a time and you're splitting it between multiple buckets, but have them get so used to seeing good things come from buckets that when they see you with a bucket, maybe it's even empty, but they are going to think, oh, that's goodness right there. I want some of that. And they will follow you uh, around. There's going to come a time when you're going to need to move them, whether you need to move them from one paddock to another, or they get out because they're just knuckleheaded pigs. And sometimes they do things like that. If you have them trained to a bucket, they'll follow you and you will thank me later.
Now, the final thing I wanted to touch on is something that didn't take place on our homestead, but did take place in our state this week, and it could greatly affect our homestead. This week, it was announced that avian flu has been detected in New York State. It was detected in a backyard flock down in Suffolk County. Now, if you're not familiar with Suffolk County, Suffolk County is down on Long Island. So that's about a three hour, maybe four hour drive from here. So it's not like it was in my backyard, but if avian flu has been detected there, it's just a matter of time before it heads up this way. Now, I actually mentioned this in Friday's blog post. And if you haven't had a chance to read that, head on over to the homesteadjourney.net slash blog, and you'll be able to read my thoughts on how I'm glad to be a homesteader in the midst of uncertain times like an avian flu outbreak, as well as the Russian and Ukrainian conflict that kind of morphed into a war this week. I'm thankful to be a homesteader and to have the security uh, that homesteading provides in the middle of uncertainty. But along with that, the arrival of avian flu in New York State is really causing me to change my approach to how I source my chicks uh, in the spring. But before I share with you the changes I'll be making, let me explain a little bit about my flock. Uh, it is NPIP certified. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means, NPIP is just National Poultry Improvement Program, I believe. And that just means that someone from the Department of Agriculture has come to my farm. They've tested my birds for pylorum, and they'll also test for avian flu if you want them. I haven't in the past had them test for avian flu because that's more for people who are selling hatching eggs or chicks across state lines. And I don't do that. Really the reason why I have them come test for pylorum is simply because it makes it easier for us to take birds to the fair. Uh, and so that's the reason why I do it. But this year I will be having them do the avian flu testing as well. And then how it works is if my birds test free of pylorum and avian flu, then I get a certificate from the government saying that I am NPIP certified. But I want to point out a couple of things. First and foremost is that the testing only happens once a year. Now, they might come do it more often if I ask them to, but generally speaking, I have them come once a year and they do the test. And folks, a lot can happen in a year. Now, in exchange for the NPIP certification, I agree to operate by certain rules. And one of those is that I will not integrate birds into my flock that come from non-NPIP certified flocks. Very frequently, I am offered free roosters. And periodically, I am also offered the odd hen or two. But I don't take them for two reasons. First of all, I don't want to infect my flock with some potential disease. If I'm bringing in a bird of unknown origin, it could be bringing all kinds of disease. And so I don't want to risk that with my flock. But secondly, I also don't want to risk the NPIP certification. And so I just simply will not accept chickens from another flock. The only Birds that I bring into my onto my farm are chicks that come from an NPIP certified hatchery. And folks, as a matter of practice, I really highly recommend that everybody do this, that you don't bring in chickens from other people's flocks, that you don't go to auctions and buy them. Uh, I would not buy them at an auction unless I knew for sure they were coming from an NPIP certified flock. But even then, those chickens have now been around chickens that potentially aren't coming from NPIP certified flocks. And so there's just a bit of a risk that comes from that. If you're going to do that, certainly quarantine those chickens away from your flock until you're confident that they are not carrying any kind of disease before you try to integrate the flocks together. But while I certainly suggest that as a matter of practice, 
especially when we're experiencing an avian flu outbreak, I certainly urge you not to source chicks or chickens from flocks or breeders that are not NPIP certified. But I would also go as far as to suggest that even if they are certified, at least this year, you may want to rethink buying from local breeders. Now, you know that I, generally speaking, am very much in favor of supporting uh, small scale farmers and small scale breeders. I think that's a very, very important thing. But when we are facing an outbreak of avian flu, it, you need to keep in mind that that flu really appears to be being passed by wild birds coming in contact with chickens. And most local breeders, most small breeders are going to allow their chickens access to the outdoors, which means that like the flock in Suffolk County, they could come in contact with a wild duck or a wild goose or I don't know, a chickadee. I, I'm not even sure what birds, wild birds can carry avian flu. But if you're allowing your chickens access to the outdoors, there is the possibility that they could come down with it. And so if that breeder is only being tested like I am once a year, then your risk could be substantial. But I would also go one step farther. And I would suggest that you do not purchase from a local feed store either. Now, the last several years, I've shared with you that I have actually been buying my chicks through a local mom and pop uh, feed store. And the reason why I do that is because I want to support them. I could order the chicks because of the quantities that I buy. I could order the chicks more cheaply by getting them straight from the hatchery. But I've chosen to buy them through my local feed store simply because I like them. I want them to stay in business. And so I want to support them in this venture. But I'm not going to be doing that this year. And the reason is because if the person who is caring for the chicks at the store is someone who has chickens themselves and that and those chickens are infected by avian flu, they could pass that on to the chicks. Now I get that the likelihood of that is rather small, but it still is a very real possibility. But also, depending on the store, a lot of people come in and, oh, cute baby chicks, and they're touching the baby chicks, and they're picking up the baby chicks, and they're getting selfies with the baby chicks, and all of the stuff that goes on, which is great in a normal, in a normal situation. But at this point in time, when you have the possibility of this avian flu, which appears to be highly transmissible, then you really want to cut out any kind of risk. At least I do. And so I'm not going to be ordering through the local farm store this year. I'm going to be ordering directly from the hatchery. And the reason why is because at the hatchery, they're bringing in hatching eggs. And once those chicks hatch, they're in a very controlled environment without much access to other birds besides the chicks that are being hatched, but they're not coming in contact in most cases with the parent flock. These chicks also don't have access to the outdoors, so they, their likelihood of coming in contact with wildlife is rather slim to none. And they're going to be packed by someone in a facility that already practices great hygiene and biosecurity. So the next person to touch those chicks, it's going to be me. And so now at this point, we have really cut out any kind of risk of exposure to them, at least minimize it to the best of our abilities. And hopefully at that point, we're going to have good quality, healthy chicks. So I think this year, if you can, I think that the best course of action, if you're thinking about bringing baby chicks onto your farm, is to order them direct from a hatchery and not get them through a feed store, not get them from a local breeder. And certainly I would highly recommend against being 
the home for unwanted chickens. Uh, if you do that, definitely make sure that you are quarantining your birds, practicing as good a biosecurity as you can, not mixing waterers and feeders between the flocks, making sure that you're trying to kind of keep yourself uh, clean as much as you can, washing your hands if you're dealing with one flock and then going to the other. Just really do your best to limit any kind of contact that might happen between those flocks if you are bringing in birds from an unknown source. All right, that was really long-winded, folks. I, I, I hope that's helpful, though. I did really want to speak this. I'd actually thought about having an entire episode on this, um, but I, I really just wanted to speak to you as soon as I could uh, because there are a lot of people asking questions about about avian flu and the impact on their flocks. And so these are just some of my thoughts and some of the things that I'm going to be doing to try to minimize the ability for this to infect my flock as much as possible. At the end of the day, though, my birds are going to be coming and going in and out, and it is what it is. They're certainly going to have the potential of contact with wild animals. I'm not going to keep them penned up indoors all the time. Just not going to do it. Um, so I'm going to roll the dice there a little bit. And so maybe you're thinking, well, Brian, you're letting them in and out. Um, so why are you being uh, so anal about the chicks? I don't know. Maybe I am being a bit uh, contradictory, but that's what I'm doing. And that's what I recommend you do. Uh, but you do you. Um, it's all good. All right. That's what we've been up to on the homestead this week. Again, not as much as I'd hoped, but certainly a bit more than last week. And we'll certainly see things ramp up over the next several weeks as spring slowly creeps up on us. Before we head on over to this week's Charting the Course, I did want to remind you about the Supporting Listeners program. For as little as $3 a month, which, as I like to remind you, is far less than one cup of coffee at Starbucks, you can help support the show and gain access to a great group of people over on the Homestead Journey Supporting Listeners Program Discord server. There are also two additional tiers, a $5 a month and a $10 a month tier that each have additional perks beyond what is offered at the $3 a month tier. So head on over to thehomesteadjourney.net slash support for more information and to get signed up today. All right, let's head on over to this week's charting the course. Today, I am honored to be joined by Amy Dingman from a Farmish Kind of Life blog and podcast. Now, Amy describes herself as a homesteader, author, podcaster, and a thinker of deep thoughts. She and her husband and their two boys have a five-acre homestead in Minnesota, and her podcast actually was one of the first homesteading podcasts I ever discovered, and it has been a huge encouragement to me. And one of the things that I really, really appreciate about Amy is that she keeps it real. She doesn't try to sugarcoat things or offer up the pretty, pretty princess version of homesteading. So among other things in this interview, we talked about the importance of keeping things real. And I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with her. Uh, and I believe you will as well. And so with that said, Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited that we finally got to do this. Finally, it's been a long time coming. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I have been so looking forward to this and uh, very excited about it. Um, one thing, I don't know if you know this or not, but I hadn't been doing this podcast very long. And you actually mentioned me as a new podcaster. And I can, it's one of those, it was like, you know, those big moments, you know, when your children <laughs> are born, when you're, when you're, you know, you're, you get married. Well, this was one of those moments. I was like, oh I was, boy, I can take you right to the spot in the garden where I was listening to your podcast and, and you mentioned, uh, mentioned me and I was like, well, what? Oh my so, gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. You have been yeah. a huge encouragement to me and uh, I always enjoy your take on things. And uh, so very excited to have you um, be a part of this tonight, or I should say today, whatever time people are listening to it at. Yeah. So you're in Minnesota. 
Um, I am so in Minnesota. Let's start right there. <laughs> uh, so when people hear the Minnesota accent, um, that's why. But just share with me a little bit about your journey into home setting, just to kick things off. So we are in Minnesota. And the funny thing is, is I didn't realize how thick my Minnesotan accent was until I started podcasting and started listening back to myself. And oh, there's the long O that people tease the Minnesotans about. I didn't hear it until I started podcasting. But as far as the homestead, uh, we've been here at the farm for 10 years. We just celebrated our 10 years of the farm. And uh, when my husband and I were first married, we lived in town. Uh, we were in town right on Main Street of a small town, which was a change for me because I came from out in the country. I didn't live on a farm, but you know, I was I was out of town and we had land. So to live in town was a little bit weird, but we knew we would eventually move out to the country and through the process of many things, we finally made it to the farm and uh, it has been a journey of figuring out what it is that we want to do here, what actually works, how things actually are once you get into it. And uh, so now at the farm, 10 years into this, we have pigs, chickens, ducks, and uh, turkeys is what we generally have here on the farm. We started with goats and horses and decided those were not our thing. <laughs> and uh, we've also had pheasants and uh, got rid of those after a few years. And uh, we've got big gardens and raspberry patches and grapevines and all sorts of things that we're doing here. And I live here with my hubby. We've been married 21 years and my boys are here. They are almost 18 and almost 19. So that's who's here with me. Nice. Yeah. Now, you made the transition 10 years ago, so your boys would have been eight and nine at that point, yep. I think, if my math is yep. correct. <laughs> yep. And uh, so for for them, what was the transition like going from being in town, which is, I guess, would have been what they had always known to country living? It, it was interesting because it was kind of a gradual progression because we moved from our, our house in town when they were actually about three and four. And we actually moved uh, to my parents' house and rented from them while we were trying to get the farm. And the process took much longer than we thought it was going to. So we were there for quite a while. So they had that taste of the country. And um, so, yeah, they were so excited to get to the farm and, you know, they wanted to get goats and pigs and all the things and, you know, do that, that farm kid thing. So they enjoyed it. They like being out in the country and being able to be loud and run and crazy and, you know, do whatever you want out here on the dead end dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Nice. Yeah. Now, how much land do you guys have? We have five acres, uh, but we are surrounded by all the land that was with the original homestead. I don't even know how many acres it is, but somebody else owns and farms all the land around us, but we never really see them unless they're planting or harvesting. So we feel like we have way more land just because we're surrounded by, you know, all these fields, but what we actually own is five acres, which works really well for us. This was, um, you know, originally a working farm. And so it's set up really nicely. Uh, we learned when we were looking for the farm that, um, you know, we thought we wanted 40 acres. And then we were like, well, do we really need 40 acres? Well, maybe we need 20. Well, maybe we only need 10. You know, you start thinking about what am I actually going to do with that amount of land? And we found this and it, I thought five acres, that's not enough for what we want to do, but it's set up so nicely. You know, it's just, it's just set up so perfectly for what we wanted. So it was perfect. Nice. Yeah. And one of the things I will tell you, I am very, very jealous of your barn. Um, <laughs> that barn. Yeah. It is beautiful. And I just, I have this, this dream someday I'm going to have a big red barn. Now, yeah. I don't know what it is, but that's my <laughs> dream. So you, you live in my dream right now. <laughs> the big red barn is, is so magical. It was built in a 1918 and it actually was not built on this property. It was actually moved here in the forties. And we have pictures from the family that lived here of that barn being moved here in the forties on the back of this huge, it was just incredible. They had to shut down the road for two days cause it got stuck. And it just like oh, seeing those awesome. old pictures and watching it come here in the forties, like just incredible to think that they could get that here in one piece back then. So that is very awesome. cool. That, yeah. So that, that just even adds to the whole, yeah. I mean, it's a cool barn, but now that I know that it got moved there, yes. it just makes it even that much cooler. It's very barn. cool. That is yeah. really, really awesome. So you moved to the country um, and, uh, you know, you've been doing the homesteading thing now for about 10 years um, mm -hmm. and certainly learned a lot of lessons <laughs> over, <laughs> over that uh, 10 years. Um, and you've been sharing that through your blog, um, mm -hmm. A Farmer's Kind of Life. Yep. And then you started a podcast. 
Yep. Uh, you've got a YouTube channel that you, I think you, you're on TikTok. You're like, you do all the things. <laughs> you're like crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, but I think a lot of that comes out of your passion for sharing with people about homesteading and, and helping, you know, people on what I like to refer to as a journey. And yeah. Um, yeah. so, so kind of tell me a little bit about that passion. I have found in my life that when I am doing something, I want to share the process with people. I want to share that journey with people. And it, it also works the other way. When I know I have people who want to listen to, here's how you do it. Here's the journey. Here's the process. It makes me more connected to the process. It makes me want to do it more. So it's kind of, you know, it works both ways. So yeah, it's been, I've always been a writer. I've always loved to make videos. I've always loved to talk, obviously. And so it's great that we have the technology we do now that we can do all these things. But yeah, I just, when I do something, I want to share it with people and say, you can do this too. And, and here's how it actually is. And yeah, I just like doing that. And obviously the the passion is very, very evident. Um, yeah. And it really comes through. <laughs> And uh, I've learned so much and really have enjoyed it. And one of the things, and it's really going to be the main topic of our conversation um, on this episode, one of the things that I really, really appreciate about you is that you really focus on keeping it real. Keeping uh, it real, yep. <laughs> you know, and that that's something I, I think you, you mentioned that quite often. Um, and that's one of the things that and, and I want to be careful because one of the things that I, I made a promise to myself when I started podcasting and even before that, when I was doing videos and whatnot, I have no interest in casting shade on any other content creator, on any other homesteader. Um, I think you and I also are, are pretty aligned politically from the standpoint mm -hmm. of you live your life and I'll live my life and right. you can be happy. And so I certainly don't want to cast shade on anybody. How people want a homestead is how people want a homestead. And there's, I think, enough room in homesteading for everyone. That oh, yeah. being said, I also feel like sometimes people have a tendency to, and, and I don't know if it's just the Instagram world that we live mm. in or it, what it is, but people have a tendency to kind of gloss over things. And, <laughs> and the, the term that Holly, uh, that was on here from the Americana podcast, uh, or the vintage Americana podcast, she was on several months ago. She called it cottage core or the pretty, pretty princess version of homesteading, which is just <laughs> stuck with me. And I think when I, I, I uh, mentioned at least cottage core to you, that was a new, a new term for you. But if you Google it, yes. it's actually really a thing. It's really a thing. Indeed. And my boys, actually, I was um, talking about being on your podcast today and doing this interview and they were like, what are you talking about? And I said, I mentioned cottage core and they knew what that was. Yeah, I was like, oh, you know what that is? You didn't have to Google it. And they're like, oh, mom, it's a thing. <laughs> Which cracks me up that teenage boys. Would know I know. What cottage core is. I know. That right. That really cracks me up. So I don't know if maybe we've been living under a rock or something. Probably. We're too busy doing chores probably to to stay up on it. Exactly. But really what cottage core is, is it's again, it's that, you know, again, not to be degrading anybody, but that pretty, mm -hmm. pretty princess version of homesteading. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things. I think it's like anything, you know, it when you see it, yeah. um, it, it's, you, you can try to define it all day long, but it's, it's those chicken coops that are just pristine with a chandelier hanging in them that, you yes. know, a chicken has not been <laughs> near that coop. Absolutely. Ever. Right. Um, right. And so I think, as content creators, we do have a responsibility to try to keep it real um, and, and really share with people, you know, that sometimes homesteading is great and it's awesome. And yeah. sometimes homesteading sucks yep. and, and we need to embrace that and not give mm -hmm. people um, kind of this false sense of what homesteading is all about. Right. And right. so that's really going to be the main topic today. I've talked a lot. So kind of share with you, me a little bit about how you avoid the temptation of going cottage core. I, I don't think that I necessarily have to avoid the, I, I don't feel tempted to do it because that's a lot of work to me. That is so much work. It's so much work to make it look pretty all the time. Um, and so I, I guess I just decided if I'm going to do this, I, I'm just going to share it the way it is. And I think that 
that just opens up so many conversations. You know, we're right now we're struggling with a rat problem in our barn and you wouldn't believe the people that when I said, I just posted on Facebook, I'm like, we are struggling with rats. We're trying to figure out what to do. You would not believe, or maybe you would, the number of people who are like, oh, you have rats in your barn. I'm so glad you said something because we have rats in our barn too, but I didn't want to say anything. Right. So yeah. Uh, yeah. No, we, we fought a rat problem last fall. Okay. Um, yep. And it's one of those things that's kind of embarrassing to admit. Right. Right. You know, ooh. Right. And, and when I first moved to the farm, um, I made friends with people out here and I was having issues with, I don't even know our eggs were disappearing or something. And, and, uh, my friend said, well, do you have rats? And I was like, rats, we don't live in New York. You know, you think like New York and sewers and rats and everything. And she's like, no rats, rats are a thing on a farm. Like, that's just what happens. You have mice, you have rats, you have rodents. That's what happens. So yeah, I, I moved here. Uh, and I probably had my own version of thinking that this is how, you know, it's going to be beautiful and pretty. Yeah, there's going to be some issues, but you know what? It, yeah, you just, once you get into it, it's wow, this is how it is. And I wanted people to be prepared for that and, and know when you walk outside and, oh my gosh, there's a dead chicken and I have no idea how it died. Like that happens and you can do you know, I remember the first time we had, I don't even remember what disease it was, went through our chicken coop and we were losing chickens left and right. And I thought I have, been, I have had chickens for 10 years. Cause we had chickens before we moved here. And I thought I've never dealt with this. And you get kind of cocky sometimes thinking, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And guess what happens to me too. So then being brave and going on social media or going on your podcast and saying, yep, guess what this happens. And it never fails. There are always people say, I'm so glad you talked about that. I'm so glad you brought that up because we dealt with that too. And we just thought we're not going to say anything. Um, so I, I just think you can make great connections with people when you're real about the journey. Cause there are great parts. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful, beautiful abs. You wake up in the morning, you see that sunrise and it's just gorgeous. And you take that picture. You don't even need a filter. There are plenty of those days. And there are other days that are not, not pretty at all. So I think that what we're trying to do is to say to people, Hey, this is a great lifestyle, but you also don't want people coming into it thinking that it's all going to be rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then they kind of feel like they've been sold a bill of goods. Yep. Yeah. And it's not about what was me because you, you know, I think we're sometimes people of extremes where it's like either it's, you know, everything is bad, sad, and horrible. Yes. Um, or everything is great, grand and glorious. Yep. Um, and trying to find, I think a little bit of that middle, middle ground is probably yes. what we're, we're seeking for. Right. Cause there's a lot of stuff to share every, every day is it's a, it's a, I can't think of the word, but it, it's a balance. It's, it's in between, it's a spectrum of all of that. And yeah, I, I, I do think there are some people who trying to counteract that kind of cottage core, everything's beautiful. The Instagram filters, that whole aesthetic that comes with it. I do think there are other people that go the other way. Mm -hmm. everything's so hard it's muddy and it's raining and everything's dying you know and that's all they talk about so it is important to find that middle ground because that's where most of it takes place most of it is the middle ground absolutely yeah and and especially when you live in climates like we do where <laughs> six months out of the year you know every picture yeah. that i'm going to take is is either going to be mud or it's going to yep. be snow yep you exactly know? And for us, really, during this time of the year, we don't have a whole lot of stuff going on. Right. And sometimes it's a little bit frustrating as a content creator. It's like, okay, what yep. do I talk about now? Because exactly. how many times can I say in the podcast? Well, a lot went on the homestead this week. Right. Yeah. Or it snowed <laughs> again, or the ground is still frozen. It's cold. You know, okay. What else is new? Yeah, I, I get that. And um, if I have listeners who live south, you know, they're, they're wondering why I haven't started my seeds yet. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not starting my seeds for at least another month, probably six weeks, because mm -hmm. that's just what it is here. And so it is hard, especially as a content creator, because you, you feel like, man, I want to see some green and I want to see all the pretty things that everybody else is sharing. And that's, that's just not my life. It's not your life. No, <laughs> we got to wait. <laughs> absolutely. And, and I think the other thing as well is it's, it's also tough um, sometimes to remember that where I'm at Mm -hmm. um, isn't where somebody else is at, right. both from how long I've been doing this, but also then from a climate perspective and so on and so forth. And so when you have that urge to say, well, I'm going to put together the 10 things you should be doing right now. Right. 
okay, well, right. maybe what I should be doing right now, but right. 10 things that somebody else should be doing right now, maybe it isn't that. Exactly. And, uh, so again, trying to make sure that we're, we're providing content that is um, helpful to people, um, but also understanding that people are at different spots and people yeah. have different interests. And, you know, again, understanding that homesteading is it's really a big tent, much bigger it is. than what I think we think it is. <laughs> yeah, that definitely. Yeah. There are a couple of uh, terms that I wanted to kind of get your, your uh, take on. Um, so when people refer to homesteading as the simple life, <laughs> how, how do you, how does that one grab you? That, well, I think I know they call it the simple life. Cause I think it, it gives that feeling of, oh, everything's so, oh, you know, but I, I guess what I like to say is, um, the simple life isn't easy. You know, I think there's, there's a difference. I think simple kind of, I don't know, it makes you think Ma Ingalls and, you know, doing your thing and it's old fashioned and it's grandma and it's, you know, all this different stuff. Oh, she's trying to pull my headphones out. Um, but it, it's not easy, you know, and it's just, and so maybe that's another reason that I, I like to talk about the real side of it because it, it, it is simple, I guess, if you want to use that, you know, kind of term, but it's, it's hard, you know, it's really hard. So I guess as long as you understand both, <laughs> both edges of that, I suppose you're okay, but yeah. And for me, I, I, I sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll rant to Bonnie a little bit about that. And I'll, I'll say to her, um, <laughs> simple is going down to the grocery store and just buying whatever's it, you know, that's simple. Like that's when, true. Yeah. You know, when, when you're schlepping water to your pigs and it's yes. 10 degrees below zero, when you're, you're busting, you know, that's not simple. Right. Right. Um, all right. Uh, another one, um, hobby farming, how, 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 <laughs> do, how, do, how do that, how does that one grab you? You know, that's interesting because we, when we moved here, someone said, oh, you've got a little hobby farm. And I was so offended because I was like, what do you mean hobby farm? I'm doing so much work here. And I'm thinking hobby farm is just, you have a couple chickens and you're doing your thing. And we had all these chickens and all these animals in our barns were full. And I'm like, this is not a hobby. But then I compare myself to, cause we live in farm country. So then when I compare myself to people who have way bigger farms and way more animals and they're like farming is their job, that's their income. That's what's paying their bills. So then I understood, okay, that's what we're talking about here. Like, you're not telling me I'm not doing anything. You're just, you know, you're, you're being real about the money and, you know, the income and, and the work. So yeah, ho hobby farm was one of the ones that got me when I first moved here, but I think, I think I've gotten over that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that's one too for me it, it's uh I, I understand what people mean by it yeah. but it was like I, I used to get really upset about it like you know a <laughs> hobby to me is something that you do if you want to and if you don't want to you don't but right. I've got animals and they really would like to be fed whether I want to do it or whether I don't want to do it right they don't whether really you care. feel well whether you are tired with it yeah like it never stops so same thing yeah a hobby is when i sit down and i want to crochet oh i'm gonna relax and i'm, I'm gonna sit down and crochet this is my hobby yeah it hobby farming doesn't feel like a hobby at all <laughs> exactly sometimes <laughs> it just feels like a lot of work it really and, does and yet on the other hand i also turn around and look at it from the standpoint of the other things that I do. And I am, I mean, I'm involved in a lot of other activities. That's one of the things why I really enjoy winter time is because it does give me an opportunity to lean into other things that, yep. that, um, you know, I, I don't have the time to do during the, the summer times. I'm not going out and playing golf and not, nothing against right. other people that do those kinds of things. You know, I'm not spending the weekends, you know, out on the boat or whatever. Um, you know, my hobbies really revolve around the homestead, <laughs> um, so right. to speak. Right. Um, yeah. but it certainly did take me a while to kind of, you know, um, get past that. And sometimes I still can't say that I really am fully past that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, cause sometimes you don't know exactly what they meant. Like, are they taking a jab at you? Like, you know, but yeah, yeah. I've, I've mostly made peace with it. <laughs> but, but certainly again, it's a, a lot of this just really comes back to it, it's, it's about keeping, keeping things real. Um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's a matter of, we have to stop define terms. And also I think be a little bit more gracious, um, in, in when people say something to us to maybe 
give them the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. um, and that it's not, you know, not take the worst case scenario that they were right. really trying to jab us, but they understand right. it as that's to them what a hobby right. farm is. If you're not yep. milking a hundred cows, if you're not, well, a hundred cows would be a small farm. If you're not <laughs> right, a right. You know, thousand cows or whatever, sure. whatever it is. It's funny. Cause I, you know, like the people that, that work the, the land around us, I mean, I'm pretty sure that their tractors cost more than our house. You know, so they're, they're probably looking at us going cute little hobby, hobby farm and they don't mean anything by it, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, two different worlds. So, and there certainly is, I think, um, a big push right now towards small scale. Um, and I, and I don't, you know, sometimes I'm trying to figure out, is this really a fad? Is it, is it right. people that are really in, in this for the long haul? Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I've come to grips with that's not really mine to worry about. Right. But people really do seem to be very interested right now mm-hmm. in understanding where their food comes from mm-hmm. and supporting smaller producers mm-hmm. uh, people that maybe only raise six or seven hogs, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a year or somebody who raises a hundred uh, meat birds for, for family and friends. Yeah. Um, and so there certainly is room, I think, for everybody in all of this. I think that's a good point because I... There have been times when I will look at, oh, there are people that think this is just a fad. Like I'm in this for the the long haul. You know, this is this, I don't plan to leave here. This is my life. And you'll find the people who, you know, I read a blog or I watch a YouTube video and I want to do this and I really don't know what I'm doing. And and I used to be frustrated by by that, you know, like here's just one more person who's going to try it. It's not, you know, but eventually I had to realize, you know, like you said, that that's, that's not my deal to worry about. Like if, if they try it and they like it, that's great. If they try it and they don't, that's great too. I mean, go back to what you were doing before, but like, that's not for me to worry about, but yeah, I had to get to that point. (laughs) And I, you know, I I say uh, very often, I think anybody can homestead. And I really do believe that I, I, you know, and part of it does, you know, depend on maybe a different understanding as far as what homesteading is. Sure. Um, because so many times we think about homesteading is like five, 10, 15, 20 acres of land in the country. Right. right. I, I think homesteading is so much bigger than that. So I really do believe that somebody who lives in an urban area can homestead. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to have to get creative. Uh, oh, yeah. But I think they can raise and grow some of their own food. And and maybe if they can't raise and grow, they can at least, at least process it and preserve mm-hmm. it and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but while I think everybody can at least do something, I also understand it's not for everybody. Right. Um, not everybody wants to do it. Right. I don't think not everybody can do it. Um, some people just don't have the emotional makeup to be able to handle um, the loss that sometimes comes along with homesteading. Um, sometimes comes along. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Keep it real. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> that loss is a huge part of homesteading. Huge. Mm-hmm. Huge. I, I still remember, I mean, before we even lived here and, and we had chickens, I still remember the first chicken I had to call because I knew it was sick and I knew it wasn't going to get better. And I just, and I just sobbed. I cried and cried and cried. And like, man, it's just crazy. Cause the longer that you're on the farm, the more you get used to it, like the more it becomes your normal, but I don't, I don't know that it ever stops bothering you, you know, and it's such a weird thing to talk about because people think, Oh, you butcher chickens all the time. It must not bother you. Well, that's not what it is. It's, you know, I understand that it's food and that's what we raised them for, but it's, I had a friend who told me if, if you don't walk into butchering day with a little bit of a weird feeling, you should, you need to be done. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the things I promised myself, not that I sit and weep over my animals. Right. I don't, Right. but the moment I start taking it for granted, yeah. That's the moment I'm getting rid of it. I mean, yeah. I, it's like, yeah. you know, if I get to the spot to where it no longer is a serious matter for me, yep. um, then to me, it's, it's time to get out and, and find something else to do with my life. Yeah, um, I agree. Because I think there's a sense to where we, we honor them mm-hmm. by um, understanding that they're giving, and, and this probably sounds way, way out there to some people, <laughs> but they give their lives so that we can live. Right. Right. And, right. and that's a very serious thing. Um, and that's one of the things that I don't think as you really start scaling up and you get big, it becomes more difficult to appreciate that. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. And so that's why I think as a small scale producer, whether we're doing it for just our family and our own consumption, or we're doing it for other people, um, mm-hmm. we do, you know, we are more connected to that. And, and it allows us the, the space, I guess, to feel those things, which I think right. is good. Yeah. I think it's human. <laughs> I think the yeah. other piece to it as well is that we, we appreciate and we value the food on our plate so much more. And, oh, yeah. and I think it's beyond even just the meat aspect of it. Um, the vegetables, anything else like that, when you've got blood, sweat, and tears in the game, oh, yeah. you respect that, honor that way more, value it way more yeah. than an exchange of dollars ever will, will do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy because those, those times when you look down at your plate and everything on that plate came from your farm or most of the stuff came from your farm, that is the most amazing feeling. It's so great. And it's, I feel like that meal fills you in a different way than any other food. You know, I I think sometimes when you're, you're going out and you're, you're getting your food and you're just like, whatever, just feed me, you know, that's a completely different process than we raised this food. We grew this food and now it's on our plate and we are consuming it. It's just, yeah. Talk about getting out there and getting woo woo. Yeah. But it's, I mean, I, I think it tastes better. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. And, and it goes even beyond just the fact that it does taste better. I think that's, but it's just, there's that, that spice of the sense of satisfaction yeah. that comes along with it. That just takes it to a yep. totally new level. Now, my son, he's 17. And uh, when I start waxing eloquent over, this is another <laughs> homestead meal. He kind of rolls his <laughs> eyes at me right now. Uh but uh, hopefully one day he'll get it. I didn't get it at his age either. So I'll uh, right. give him a little bit of grace there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is. It's so satisfying when you sit mm-hmm. down and you look at your plate and it's like, wow, yeah. you did this. Yeah. When we, uh, when we do our pig butchering here, I mean, it's a, it's a two day process, right? And I am an early morning person and I need to be in bed by like eight o'clock. And that second day of butchering, we aren't getting done until midnight, one o'clock in the morning, because we try to get everything done. Like we are going to, okay, everything is processed. And now we are going to make the brats and we are going to get the bacon brining. Like it, it, we want everything as done as it possibly can be. And I am just, by the end of that day, I'm not a nice person. <laughs> I'm just like, forgive me for what I say, because I'm so tired right now. But man, that next day we always have a taste test of, you know, the little bit of like brat meat that didn't get stuffed into, you know, the casing and the little bit of the breakfast sausage. And so traditionally we always sit down and cook that stuff up and just have kind of a buffet of a taste test. And man, I'm like, it was all worth it every single time. I'm like, yep. Doesn't matter. It was all worth it. Kind of like, you know, yeah, you have a baby and you're just like, I'm never going to do this again. And yeah. And then totally worth it. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely. The other piece to it as well is when it's uh, whatever it is, 10 degrees below zero outside snow on the ground. um, And, uh, you know, you're enjoying that harvest that you've preserved. Yes. um, It's like, okay, this, this, this is why we do this. Yeah. Um, This is, this is very, very satisfying. And again, I think that's one of those pieces of, of keeping it real for people. There is that satisfying Mm -hmm. component to it. Um, certainly sometimes we, not sometimes, a lot of times we do experience loss, but there's also a lot of gain that we experience as well. Mm -hmm. And, and it's just a balance between the two. Yeah. You can't let the highs get too high and the lows get too low (laughs) because just as soon as you think you got it figured out, life throws your (laughs) curveball. Right. Yeah. I, and I think that's, one of the reasons it's important to keep it real because it's very easy for uh, some people to focus on those highs and make it all about the the highs and everything's great and wonderful. And and you have to understand, like it's, it's made up of all these things that happen, the highs, the lows, the loss, the gain, the birth, the, all the problems and the, Oh, we figured this out. Now this broke. And now we, it's crazy. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. (laughs) <laughs> and certainly I don't think you appreciate the highs until you've experienced the lows. And that's I think that's, point. I mean, it's not just homestead. I mean, I think it's right. life. Right. Um, and, I, and I think that's the other thing that people sometimes lose sight of with regards to homesteading is homesteading is just life. It's just yeah. living life a, a bit differently, but 
life is life. Yeah. And sometimes life is great and sometimes <laughs> life sucks. Yep. And, and it's and it's all good. Um but you know, we do have to kind of give both sides of the story yes. and understand, yep. as you said, life is really lived mainly in the in-between. Yeah. You know, yeah. between those highs and those lows. Mm -hmm. um, and not everything is an Instagram worthy post. <laughs> right. Right. Although I will say it's been interesting. You mentioned that I was on TikTok and I have seen a lot of people. I don't know if you're on TikTok, but man, there, there is a community of homesteaders out there that are really pushing. This is what my farm really looks like right now. You know, like it is winter and everything is frozen solid and there is chicken poop everywhere because I cannot move it. It is frozen solid. And this is what my barn looks like right now. Mm -hmm. And so I love seeing that happen. Like it's, it's weird, you know, because you wouldn't think TikTok, you know, would be that. But it's it's really cool to see people just taking their short little videos of here's what I'm dealing with right now. And it is not awesome. And so I, I love that. I love that reality and that honesty. That's, that's cool. You may have just convinced yeah. me to check TikTok out. Yeah. Because I thought TikTok was just a bunch of um, high school girls dancing in the bedroom. That's, <laughs> that's about the only TikTok videos I ever seen. So there is a really, really awesome homesteading and like self-reliance community on there. So I, I am surprised. I did not hmm. think that I would find that there, but it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm, I may have to check it out. Although yeah. it's like, all, all this time that you tried, okay, you got this social media, <laughs> that social media. It's like, I know. oh my goodness, I know. how am I going to ever get anything done on my homestead right. if I'm uh, checking all of that stuff out? And that's one of the things that I love about podcasting is that podcasting is something that you can give to people that they can take yes. and go with it. You know, So as they're doing other things, as they're working on the farm, I mean, when yep. I heard you talk about my podcast... <laughs> I was in the garden. Um, <laughs> and again, I can take you just about to the garden bed where I heard that. Um, but it is, it's, it's an awesome medium where you can communicate information to people where they yeah. can carry it with them. Yeah. It's the ultimate in multitasking. I say it's just stick the, uh, and as soon as, and I call it farm season, like April is about the time we really start doing stuff here till probably October. So I call that farm season and man, the, the earbuds are in my ears all day long and I am catching up on podcasts and listening to audiobooks because it's just my hands are busy doing the things and the information's going in and I just man, it's just great. I love listening to podcasts. So I was so glad I'm so excited when I find another home setting podcast. So when I found yours, I was like, ah, it's another one and it's great. It's easy to listen to and it's like organized and I just love it. So yes. Well, thank you very much. And <laughs> uh and again, you have no idea how much of an encouragement that was to me because as you well know, podcasting is also a very frustrating medium where it sometimes feels like you're on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Right. You're talking to yourself. Abyss, and it's yep. like, <laughs> does anybody hear me? Right. Right. And it's, and it's not really easy for people to, to respond because again, if they're doing this on the go, they're right. not going to respond and, you know, stop and send you an email. They're not going right. to, Oh, I got to pull the car over. I've got to, <laughs> you know, right. wash my hands. I've got, you know, chicken guts on, I've got to exactly. send Amy an email, yep. you know, it's not like YouTube. Um, and so uh, again, keep, I guess we're keeping it real about what we go through. Yes. Um, um, but it is very also satisfying to, to be able to communicate with people and share with people, um, you know, what we do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just really appreciate your approach to it. Um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun to be a part of what you guys do there in Minnesota. And uh, <laughs> Minnesota. <hopefully laughs> one of these days I'll make it out that way. Yeah. So you have some exciting things um, that you are just launching. Uh, I do. And so <laughs> why don't you just share a little bit about that? Because I'm excited about it. I've got to get my subscription in. <laughs> so I decided, you know, here we are talking about technology and podcasting and YouTube and TikTok and all of this, but I have decided there is, there is something a little bit awesome about maybe going back a little old fashioned and getting back into snail mail because I love snail mail. I, I am just a nerd about getting the mail and getting something fun in the mail. So I have actually started a uh, snail mail newsletter for a farmish kind of life. So it's a monthly snail mail newsletter. Uh, it's three pages front and back. So six pages, uh, black and white monthly uh, information about homesteading, self-reliance, DIY recipes, all the things that you normally hear from a farmish kind of life, but just on paper, 
in your mailbox once a month. So I am so excited about this. And I decided, well, I'm going to try this. And I like, I'm overwhelmed with how many people are excited about this. I think people are like reaching for, they want that paper. They want that old fashioned. They want the information that they don't necessarily have to log into a website to get, or I don't want to deal with the chaos that's going on in the world. So I don't want to have to find this on Facebook or YouTube or anything like that. Um, I think there's also, you know, you can save the newsletters, put them in a binder. You will have that information. It's not going to go away if you can't get on the internet or if certain parts of the internet disappear. Um, and, and I also feel it's kind of like a revolution almost. A friend said, it's kind of like you're starting a revolution because, you know, unless unless the the post office is going to start opening our mail and reading what you're sending. Like you have this medium, here's my information. And nobody's going to tell me, well, you can't say that you can't send that. You can't write that article. So I'm excited about it. It's um, I'm sending out the first issue in a couple of weeks. So it's, I'm super excited to see what happens with it. So. And it's certainly an opportunity for you to be able to keep it real coming yeah. right back to that, because again, oh, yeah. you don't have to worry about Right. Oh, YouTube's going to give me a strike because I said <laughs> this, or, yes. I mean, and, and even uh, not to get too conspiratorial here, but I mean, they're starting to take down, you know, podcast episodes, yeah. um, you know, of, you know, Joe Rogan, the, that's kind of yep. the big hot topic going on yep. right now. And so it's yeah. like, that's certainly a way for you to be able to communicate and not that, yeah. you, I mean, you are somebody who has put yourself out in the public square quite a bit. So it's not like people are going to get wackadoodle stuff from <laughs> this. This is Amy's wackadoodle newsletter. <laughs> right. Right. But on the other hand, again, it is that opportunity to, you know, to, to really share pe with people what, you know, real homesteading is all about and yeah. not have to worry about being, I hate to use the term, but I'm going to use it deplatformed. Um, <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So where, where can people uh, sign up for that? If you go to my website, a farmers kind of life.com, you can, in the menu, there's a spot that says the farmish papers and you can go there and that will give you all the information that you need. And there at the website, you have all your social media links, yep. all, all, all the there. stuff. The, it's kind the, of home base. The best <laughs> place to find Amy is at a farmers life, a farmish kind of life.com. Yes. There we go. So I think yes. I got it right. A farmish kind of life.com. Yes. Don't want to send people to the wrong, uh, <laughs> wrong website. Oh, well, they'll find me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'm around on all the things, on all <laughs> right. the things. Right. Um, well, and one other thing too, I guess we can, we can mention this as well. You did launch a new podcast with a, with several other podcasters. So as if you weren't busy enough, um, it, that's been fun. I've really been enjoying, uh, I think I've, do you have four episodes out of that now? I think five. we just did the fifth one last night. Yep. So I, I, I think I've just finished up the second episode of that, getting ready to dive into the third episode. Um, but just share a little bit about that. That's a little bit of a different thing. It has a homesteading component to it, but it's a little <laughs> bit more on like the liberty side of things, yeah. which is yeah. really what interests me about it because I'm, right. I mean, people know I'm a crazy libertarian, so um, it is what it is. It is super fun. It's a group of uh, seven of us and just different podcasters kind of in the homesteading DIY liberty kind of, you know, this spider web of different things. And we just decided that we were going to get together and we were going to do this weekly podcast. And um, the first episode, uh, we were all together. And after that, it's just a few of us at a time because seven or eight people is a lot of people to listen to. So that that is not the norm for the podcast, but we just have a topic every week and whoever wants to hop on and talk about that is on for the night. And it's usually 60 to 90 minutes. And we've we've been just having a blast with that. And it's it's great. I'm trying to think. Uh, I think the second episode was about getting starting with prepping. I think we have some episodes about side hustles. Um, I was the host of the podcast last night. It was homeschooling. We talked about that. And yeah, we've got just lots of different topics. I mean, because that's a huge umbrella, you know, mm -hmm. it's a huge umbrella to of, of topics that we can cover. But yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what happens with that. It's a great group of people. So and, and the title of that podcast is Fireside Freedom. 
and that can be found. I know it's on YouTube if people want to watch it. Is it on all the podcast networks? Because I've been watching it's, it on YouTube. It should be on most of them. Uh, Firesidefreedom.net is the website. So you can okay. actually listen to it there. But uh, we usually live stream on YouTube, Float, and uh, Odyssey. So, and sometimes those live streams die. So the, <laughs> ironically, the most uh, reliable network that we, we live stream on is YouTube. But, you know. So that's kind of our backup. You know, we prefer Odyssey and Float, but YouTube is what works the best right now. So yeah, it's great. So uh, it's Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Central Excellent. is when we live stream. Excellent. Yeah. So definitely check that out. So you've got a lot of stuff going on um, <laughs> and it's just a lot of fun to to uh, to watch it. So I definitely encourage people to check you out, a farmerskindoflife.com and then uh, firesidefreedom.net. Fire, yep, firesidefreedom.net. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much for being a part of this. Thank you so much for having me on. So folks, I hope you enjoyed that. I had such a blast chatting with Amy. You know, there are times when you meet, and obviously we're meeting virtually via Zoom, but you meet somebody for the first time and you just click. And there are just so many areas of interest. And, and it's just like, You've been best friends your entire life. And I certainly had that vibe uh, with Amy and I could have just kept going and going and going, but I didn't want to have a three hour long podcast. I know Joe Rogan gets away with it, but I'm not Joe Rogan. So I hope to have uh, Amy on the show again in the future. I've got a couple of topics in mind that I'd like to cover with her. And uh, so anyhow, Amy, thank you so much for being a part of this. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And I do have links to all of our social media stuff in the show notes, but I really strongly urge you to head on over to a farmishkindoflife.com to check out her blog, her links to her books on Amazon, and to sign up for that brand new newsletter, The Farmish Papers. In fact, she posted some pictures a couple of days ago of her stuffing envelopes. And I cannot wait to get out there to my mailbox and open that up and dive deep inside the mind of Amy Dingman from A Farmish Kind of Life. As we wrap things up, if you would like to contact me, my email address is brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.